Right to be Read podcast, episode number 46. Interview with Paul Colliani. You are listening to the Right to be Read podcast, and this is your host, Ani Alexander. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Right to be Read podcast, the podcast that inspires and encourages writers. I'm your host, Annie Alexander, and I'm truly happy that you are listening to my podcast. It really means a lot to me, and thank you for coming over time and time again. Well, uh, before I start my interview, which is a bit different from the others, I suppose, uh, I would like to tell that I started using Twitter recently and I'm really getting very good effect from it. And I think that it's a very powerful tool for authors. So uh, that is why I decided to create a small PDF for you where you will get more than 100 Twitter hashtags specifically for writers, the hashtags which successful writers use on Twitter. I hope that it will be useful to you as well. So you can get that either in the show notes on iTunes and in the show notes of the podcast of this episode or on my website at www.annealexander.com slash 46, which is today's episode. So let's hop over and start the interview. Well, today I'm talking to Paul Colliani. He's the founder and host of the Overwhelmed Brain Personal Growth Podcast, which is designed for critical thinkers. He's also the author of the book called Clear the Path to Happiness, Powerful Practical Steps to Become Happier, Feel Better and Enjoy Living. And since his book title is, you know, ideally illustrates what we want from life, I decided that we had to have a chat and find out what's going on. So hello, welcome to the show, Paul. Hey, Annie, it's great to talk with you. So, can can you tell us what you've been doing before and what are you doing now? Oh, wow. You mean before all this entrepreneurial and authoring and podcasting stuff? Yeah, before the personal growth path you took. Well, my personal growth path started about 10 to 15 years ago. But basically, my entire life, I've been into technology. I've worked with computers and I've had a, a myriad of positions in life, but for the most part, I was working in IT. I was working with computers. Mm -hmm. And right right up until last year is when I got the entrepreneurial bug. And I really wanted to do something more personal, take more control of my life, take the reins of my life. Because last year I was in an IT project in a hospital and the managers kept Promising, promising me that I would get a full-time position there because I was on a project basis. Mm -hmm. And they kept promising me month after month. And I finally cornered the manager and I said, okay, you keep promising it to me, but I never see it. And then I remember one manager telling me, well, just keep an eye on the job boards and we'll see what happens. And I was like devastated because <laughs> they kept yeah. promising me and I just, I just assumed it was going to happen. So I went through a couple of days of just this miserable feeling like, man, just people are controlling my life and I just had to get out of that. So that's when that the entrepreneurial bug hit me and I said, I need to do something on my own. And while you were working with the computers, while you were still working, did you do anything related to personal development parallel to that or just decided to do that once you were disappointed and got out? <laughs> Good question. Um, like in 2009, I actually opened a a practice helping people. I was a consulting hypnotist because I had taken taken training and, cert and got certified in a few things like uh, NLP, that's Neuro Linguistic Programming Hypnosis, and I did a lot of coaching stuff. So I opened a practice, a practice in, in Texas um, and I realized that I just wasn't ready to go out on my own. I just wasn't prepared. I still had personal growth to deal with myself. Mm -hmm. So even though, even though I've been studying personal growth, and, and learning all this stuff for about 10 or 15 years. Uh, and I thought I was ready to open my own practice. It just, it wasn't happening. I was, I was even scared to charge for my services. So I was definitely not an entrepreneur yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's, it's a mindset thing also, right? I mean, you're, yeah. you're not, uh, it's the same with the writers, by the way, because mm. uh, many writers 
don't become writers until they believe that they are already writers. So, I mean, all these uh, all these uh, expressions they use, like newbie writers, aspiring writers, <laughs> wannabe writers, and things like that, they're putting all these words as an excuse. And, you know, I don't believe they can really feel themselves writers until they decide that they are. So they're looking for permissions. They're looking for someone to tell them that they write well enough to publish mm. a book, etc., etc. So it's, uh, yeah. And I think that it's very similar with the entrepreneurs as well. Until they believe that they can be entrepreneurs, they have these problems with, you know, coming up with uh, the actions and, and really actually doing the things i think there's a tipping point that you have to reach too it's like for me i finally got to that boiling point of uh i just can't take it anymore i've got to do something on my own and as soon as that hit i snapped and i made a decision i made a commitment to start this new venture and once that happened then everything lined up it's like once you develop that direct focus everything just seems to line up to support your vision to support your journey. So that's what happened to me last year. As soon as I did that, I mean, I've been an aspiring author for years and years and years. I was probably everyone <laughs> listening has. It's just like, I always have this book idea in, in me. And every time I've gone to start it, I just start writing and go, uh, I'm not really interested in writing anymore. And I would stop it. Mm -hmm. And it, it's because I never reached a tipping point of something that I was just so focused and passionate about and, and my mind just shifted. So yeah, it was a mind shift and a mindset for sure. Okay. So when, uh, when you left your job or your project, it was a project. Yeah. You said, yeah, it was a project. I was a subcontractor. <laughs> okay. So, so, uh, you left that, you decided not to look for another job <laughs> and what happened next? <laughs> well, for the next six months, I've been saving money. I wanted to do something with the money I've been saving because I knew that, um, I don't know, maybe I knew unconsciously that something was going to happen in the future because being a subcontractor, you're always on these temporary positions mm -hmm. and you might, get a, you might get a month or two off here and there. So you kind of need money mm -hmm. as a backup plan yeah. and you should have money saved in the, in the, the background anyway. But um, I was saving more and more money. So for the next six months, I decided to work as much as I possibly can, as much overtime as I possibly can and just save as much money as possible so that I could just get out and not have to worry about getting another job right away and just going full force into, mm -hmm. into this new venture. So that's what I did. I just saved money, prepared myself. I, they call it building the runway. I built my runway uh, so that I would have a long enough stretch just in case uh, everything I did failed. <laughs> okay. And did you know already what exactly you will be doing? It's it, when I got that news that I wasn't going to be hired on and I should just watch the job boards, I started looking online to how to make money for yourself. This mm -hmm. is my first venture. I was, I've never been an entrepreneur. I've never been someone who does, uh, someone who can just create from scratch and build from scratch all by myself. I always needed an employer. I always needed a company. I felt like I did. I felt like I always needed a company there to support me, pay me, and just so I could have some sort of structure in place. I was never uh, self-organized enough. Mm -hmm. But when I made that decision and uh, started focusing on that, I forget your question. What was your question? <laughs> <laughs> did you know it, what exactly you will be doing once you're out? Oh, that's right. That's right. So <laughs> I was going somewhere with it. Um, so when I started looking at this entrepreneurial stuff, I found people like Pat Flynn of Smart Passive Income. Yeah. John Lee Dumas of Entrepreneur Fire. I found a podcast. I'd never heard podcasts before. So I, I started listening to the podcast. And the more podcasts I listened to, the less interested I was in what they were talking about and the more interested I was in podcasting itself. Uh -huh. uh, because they were saying things like anyone can do a podcast and talk about anything they want. And I'm like, wow, what could I talk about? What could I think about? And what thing came to one can one thing came to mind was what do I love talking about all the time and I never get tired of and it was always personal growth I was I was always the guy that stayed after five talking to my coworkers helping them through personal problems I was always that guy mm -hmm. so I was thinking I know enough to share and I love talking about it 
So once I, once I figured out that I was going to create, that's what I was. I, I wanted to create a podcast. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I, I had no clue what was involved. All I did was just purchase all the audio equipment. It cost me like $1,500. I went all oh, the God. whole, yeah, I, I invested. I invested. I had the money. I was going to invest it. I said, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it full force. That means I was going to commit to myself. And that's one of the things when you focus on something so strongly, you commit, you just go all in. Yeah, well, I, I didn't really do that, to be honest. <laughs> and and I presume that if you do that, then it will be much, much harder to give up because you already invested so much in it. It's a, it's a big investment. At the same time, I also knew two things. I also knew, one, I had a runway. I had enough money, even after that investment, to last quite a while. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, if it all failed, again, if it all failed, because I always like to play, the, play out the worst case scenario and what would I do? If it all failed, then I could sell this whole package to a podcaster who would love it. Yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't lose any money. <laughs> yeah, well, true, true. <laughs> it all worked out. <laughs> okay, so you, you bought the equipment and you, you learned about how to podcast, I presume, somewhere, yeah? Took, uh, took, a, took a little while to figure out how to use a mixer and how to get your how to get an audio file on on the web did you, you use any resources or you did it all yourself i mean i i used a ton of resources when i was learning about this stuff i you know i went to cliff ravenscraft site the podcast answer com, yeah mm -hmm. and um i started looking at his tutorials then i found pat flynn's tutorials yeah. smart passive income mm -hmm. and so i found all these different tutorials and i found some other people that aren't as big that had some really good tutorials on youtube i just kept watching and watching and watching Still, you never found the exact one you needed. <laughs> well, I was lucky enough to find the exact one I needed. Oh, you so, were? Yeah. <laughs> because well, share I that resource. <laughs> well, it's, I, I always share it with everyone. It's, it's oh, a podcast incubator but by Meryl oh, Bereket. It's, it's just, you know, for me, it was ideal. And oh, from the moment I started uh, going through his tutorial videos until I launched, it took me three weeks. I was learning oh, and I was recording recording the interviews parallel to each other so like three weeks okay you know I, I was focused on that so that was all I did for these three weeks but it took me three weeks to launch the podcast so you know I was like you know I, I watched uh, Pat Flynn's tutorials as well before that but you know um, I needed something more detailed and uh, right, yeah right. <laughs> Okay, so now, I mean, I, I can imagine that you had this podcast and I, I've listened to your podcast. It's amazing. And I, <laughs> I'm, I'm absolutely sure that you put even much more time into it and effort than many, many other podcasters because it's, it's, it's uh, quite long. It's a solo episodes, which is more difficult to do than interviews. And it's packed with so much value. So it's, it's quite, I mean, I can imagine how much you are working for that that so and you had your podcast how did you end up parallel to that writing a book why, why did you decide to write a book after that well thank you for that compliment that was very sweet <laughs> no i mean i mean it because you know i'm i'm not i'm i'm quite picky about podcasts to be <laughs> honest because i don't have too much time and i don't listen to them very often so when i do i make sure i listen to the good ones <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it, it takes about, it takes a full, at least three or four days to create an episode. And that's, it's crazy that you don't, you don't hear from that. But what was happening is because it, I write about eight to 10,000 words a week uh, for podcasts, for my podcast. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just writing all the time. The subject matters I talk about are very deep and I need to formulate my thoughts on paper in order to actually convey the message I want to convey on the show. Mm -hmm. Plus I'm getting, I'm getting into very deep stuff with people. This is like, it, this is like core emotional stuff where people are very sensitive. They're very vulnerable. So I don't want to say the wrong things. So I put a lot of time and effort that when I take people to this vulnerable, vulnerable place inside of them, that I'm not saying the wrong thing. Like, now you can go jump off a bridge and celebrate because that could, <laughs> yeah. that could, that could lead to something very dangerous because they could take it very literally and do it. Uh, but after about a year of, well, maybe about eight months of writing, uh, 10,000 words a week, I was like, 
this is the perfect opportunity to turn my episodes into ebooks. I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm already writing a book a week because you can, you can write an ebook with 10,000 words. Um, so that's what happened. That thought occurred to me a few months ago. I was like, this is crazy. I have all this income opportunity potential to take what I've already written and convert it into ebooks so that it's more digestible and people can read it at their own leisure at their own time and they can bookmark and they can tap to any section if they use an e-reader or whatever. So that's what happened. A few months ago, I just started realizing I'm writing a book a week. Why, why aren't I taking advantage of the t- this that I've already created and putting it into a book fashion? So that's how that started. Yeah, especially now when uh, people are even using ghostwriters and not even writing their books, but still have their books in Kindle. I, I have I have a bittersweet thing about that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So so that makes me think that this is not your last book. So you use. I mean, you have a lot to come <laughs> later. On. My, yeah. I have a strategy. Okay. Want to share it with us? Yes, I do. I'll share everything. Um, the idea is, I'm going into this. Like, first of all. I still don't consider my, myself an author, even though I have a published book now. I still don't consider myself an author. I don't know why. Maybe because I just feel like I'm a host, a podcaster, and that I've already talked about this stuff on the air. But you're still going to reach a different segment of the population when you create a book. Mm-hmm. So I just have this. I'm still coming to terms with that. But my strategy is I'm going to create uh, for every episode, I'm going to create an ebook. And every episode that is worthy of an ebook, I should say. Um, because I already have the content. And so what that means is with every book I create, I don't have to create, uh, I don't have to put all my eggs in one basket and go, okay, I'm going to put my book out there and I'm going to rely on this to make the money for me. So I don't have to pay rent anymore. It pays itself. You know, there's that expectation I'm trying to pull away Mm -hmm. saying, I don't, I don't want to create these expectations where my books are going to, or, or a book is going to pay for all my bills. What I want to do is multiply my exposure in the marketplace book after book after book. So by putting more books out there and good quality books, not ghost writers or anything like that, even though they might be good quality, but uh, this is my voice. I want my voice out there. I'm already all over the web when you look up the overwhelmed brain. But once I get into Amazon, that's another gigantic search engine. And uh, once I get my one book in there, if one person buys one book and they like it, they're likely to buy another book that you created. Absolutely. So that, that would be two sales. If I made three books, that would be three sales for one person, most likely. So my plan was this year to make, you know, 20 books. It's not going to happen. But uh, I do want to eventually keep writing books because I know my content is good enough. Uh, that people and people listen to my show multiple times. They listen to my show three or four times. So I know that I'm creating good content. So if I put that into a book fashion and uh, I get one $2.99 sale, which I make two bucks off of, again, it just multiplies exponentially the more you have out there. They're just, yeah. they're all multiple, they're all, they're all forms of income streams. So they're all there. It's a multiple form of income streams. I love that idea. And I think that's a, a great way to go. Okay, so it's interesting because, I mean, since you told that you don't yet uh, feel as being an author and you're more (laughs) a podcaster, and since you're taking your book's content from your podcast episodes, it's like, uh, you know, I have a feeling that your books are the deliverables of of your podcast. And I I, uh, think that it's a really nice strategy because your episodes, since they are quite long and very deep, and and I, I can imagine why people are listening to it several times because they are, I mean, they're so concentrated that, you know, you need to get into that and you have yourself to be concentrated by listening to it in order to get the whole meaning of it. So uh, I think mm. that uh, having a parallel to that, I mean, even if you've listened to the episode, having the book in place where you can, you know, take your own pace and reread and you know go through it and highlight and get quotes etc i think that's that's really good uh, i mean this is uh, where most probably most of your loyal listeners will become your readers as well yes i i'm hoping that's the case in fact 
It, what's nice about having the podcast in place before writing the book is that I already have a foundation of people following me. Yeah. So there's already people listening and, and trusting what I have to say, for, as far as I know. And uh, what happens is I, now that I have this place to, I can advertise my book because mm -hmm. it's my podcast. I can do anything I want. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I will reveal a secret to my listeners. Like the, oh, the, the main thing that intrigued me most and made me think that, you know, I, I have to have Paul on my show was that in one of the Facebook groups, uh, in Pat Flynn's Facebook group for Kindle Books, which we mentioned several times in different episodes, you said that uh, you actually launched your book your own way and did not <laughs> go to the most you know recommended routes and and all the advices that you get all over internet and even my podcast or you know any other self-publishing podcasts and you did things completely different and one of the things you mentioned was that you you created your own cover and and i'm sure you did many other things which people usually don't do or at least are not recommended to do so <laughs> can you tell us what you did and what kind of results you got well, one of the things I wanted to do going into this was create what I call the soft launch. Uh -huh. I'm sure that term's out there, but I wanted to soft launch my book and not make a lot of hoopla just to find out what happened. Mm -hmm. so, because this, is, this is what's nice, not having to rely on one thing for your source of income, is that you can experiment. So, And, and it also takes the pressure off. It, it actually helps you finish something just to experiment to see what happens instead of having to finish something and having all this pressure that it's going to be your main source of income. So that's one of the things I want to do is just do a soft launch and, and not like advertise it and pre-hype it all over the place. So that's one thing I decided to do is not like, um, I think you had a really good guest on Nick Loper. He's like, he had a 20,000 book launch. I was yeah. like, that's, that's great. And it, it, it's going to work and it's going to make money, I'm sure. But I wanted to find out what would happen if I didn't follow his advice. Like one of the things, um, and other people's advice. One of the things, yeah, make my own, make my own cover. You know, I don't, I'm not a graphic artist. I, I don't draw well, but I, I can do enough with it where it just looks decent. So it's kind of hard to look at your, your own stuff objectively and go, wow, that's really good. So one of the things that really helps is having a group of people that you can show your cover to and say, what do you think? And then, and don't have them, uh, compliment you just tell them just tell them to tell you what's wrong with it mm -hmm. i don't want to know what's i don't want to know what's right with it just tell me what's wrong with it and that's what i did and my first cover looked like an old tony tony robbins book <laughs> and i and i'm like i don't know if this is this looks it looks good to me and that's one of the problems is it looks good to you but no one else it looks <laughs> good to me but uh i better run this across the people i'm in a group with on facebook and they looked at it and was like, yeah, that looks dated. That looks like from the 80s. I was like, oh, geez, I didn't even think about that. So I decided to just put my face on the cover. I'm like, okay, here's, <laughs> it's not, is this narcissistic? I don't know. But I put, a, I put a big picture of my face on the cover because you know what? I am my brand. I mean, I'm, I went into this uh, with the idea that we're all, we all have an overwhelmed brain. So I figured down part of that. And Everyone knows me as the host on the show, at least my, the people that listen. So I'm just going to put my face on the cover saying, hey, I'm here for you. I'm creating this book for you. This book is for you. And I'm going to walk you through it. So I just figured put my face on the cover and then make a nice blue background like I have in my ocean logo on my website. And, and I just started to decide to do that. So that was one of the things. I created my own cover. And I was like, I don't care if it doesn't work. I just don't care. <laughs> it's an experiment. We'll see what happens. Everyone says, you need to, you know, pay someone to do your cover. I'm like, no, I'm going to, I'm not going to do that. So, okay, that's one experiment. I'll uh, see what else did I do. I, I didn't hype it. I did, I did do something because I have a newsletter of about 200 and I think 30 something people now, uh, subscribers. Mm -hmm. I did tell them, I'm going to give you guys the book for free. You guys are in my inner circle. I want you to have it. So they were the first ones to know about it. And of course, I did the, I did the five day for free launch on Amazon. And that was a, a really good idea. But um, so that was kind did of along you, the lines. Did you promote that free period somehow besides your email list? I sent it to my email list. And then 
I think you got me into Patch Group. Yeah. Um, you brought me into Patch Group. Which I didn't even know about. It. I didn't even know he had an ebook group. And so when I got into that group, I was like, you know, I don't want to just go on there like a lot of people do and say, hey, I have a free book. Check it out. Because it's just, it's so valueless. Well, I'll tell you, if if that was the only thing you would say, me me or any of the other admins would delete it immediately. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, no, I just thought that was so valueless. It's like when people, I've seen people do that. And it's like, if you're all you're going to do is just announce your book, it's obviously spam. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to put everything I've learned so far because that's going to be valuable to someone. And when I did that, a lot of people commented, including yourself. And I was like, wow, there's so much support here. I can't believe it. Yeah, that's so an I, awesome book, uh, awesome group. It's just, you know, you always get feedback and, you know, uh, quite constructive feedback, which is very important. So, um, yeah, that group is is good in terms of the environment and the mood and the support you get there. Well, I think one of the um, commenters said, you know, you said that you weren't doing things the way the, quote, pros do it, but you're doing a lot of the things that the pros do. And I was like, really? I, I wasn't even, I just stopped, I did a media blackout. I was like, I don't want to even know what the pros do because I wanted to approach my book launch as a reader. If I was a reader, how would I uh, buy my book or want my book? Why would I want my book? So I thought, I started thinking about things. One of the things I thought of was I would want my book to be free because I don't know you as an author. Yeah. And I like the subject matter. So I want to get a taste of that subject matter. I want to get a taste of your uh, writing style and see if I like it. But I don't want to pay $3. I know it's only $3, but still, it's a gallon of milk. I don't want to pay $3 unless I know who you are. So I definitely knew that the free route was the best way to get my name out there. Plus, uh, being in the KDP Select, the Kindle, yeah. the um, Direct, Amazon program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Plus, Direct. being in that, yeah, gives you the, that option to be free. And it gives you the option so that people will loan your book to others. And I was thinking, if I get it into more hands, that means more people will find my name. And if, if I'm not worried about making money, but more about exposure, then it brings people back uh, to my home base. It brings people back to my website. It gets people more interested in everything else I'm doing. I mean, my podcast, but other books that I might write. So I just started thinking of things from a reader's perspective instead of a promoter, an entrepreneur, and how would I be enticed or attracted to my book? So that's that's where my mindset went. And and how many people downloaded it for free approximately? I had like um a few hundred at first. And then after someone on Pat's group said he was going to put it on bookbucks.net, I got like another 750. So I had, I had a thousand for the initial launch for really no hype and no marketing. Well, that that's quite a decent number. Of, I mean, is it? I have no clue. <laughs> well, in a sense that if you haven't done anything specific, but send your email list uh, an email and then you know a message in a group, uh, I think it's it's quite a good number because you know for twenty k like Nick Lopper, you had to do much much more. So yeah. I, I think that for 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 what you did, the the result. I mean, imagine in in thousand Kindles your book is there right now so it, that's quite impressive that. well i love that and a couple of um well at least one side thing that i didn't know would happen one benefit was i ended up on goodreads i didn't know they did they do they suck your book in if you're not, uh, listed as a popular book in amazon or do you have uh, to have i don't know i have to check that because what we do usually we we sign in, uh, we register in Goodreads and then become Goodreads authors and then we add our book there. But I, I presume uh, that readers can add the book as well because any book which is on Amazon with its uh, ASIN number can be added to Goodreads. So someone apparently added it there. It may be one of your readers. If it's not you, then, you know, most probably it's one of your readers, I guess. I think that's what happened because I went on there. I mean, I, I searched for my book name in Google and saw that it was on Goodreads. And I was like, Goodreads? And I saw the Alexa ranking for Goodreads, which is, you know, how high your web website ranks. Google's number one. And uh, Goodreads was like 273. It was just this very, very, very low number in a good way. Low is good. 
I was like, wow, I'm on this site that has a giant, well, fantastic. Well, I'll tell you, Goodreads is an amazing place because it's a social network specifically for writers and readers. And when I say readers, I mean I mean mostly avid readers who read on regular basis. So it's kind of like already targeted audience all in one place. Well, they claim to have about 30 million members. Yeah. So. So it's That's it's a massive it's just, number. Yeah, Goodreads is is really good and for both fiction and nonfiction, and it's very active. And uh, uh, there are many many things to do with Goodreads, but you know, I, I'm sure you'll get there later. On. <laughs> no, I'm I'm already there. <laughs> no, what I mean is like in terms of activities and things oh, to do. There. <laughs> I got it. I got you. Once it was out of the promo, it was not free anymore. What happened next? Well, I I kind of knew that once the freebie stopped that no one would buy because <laughs> the ranking of the book just drops to the bottom. So now you have to rely on SEO. You have to rely on people finding your book organically or any type of promotion that you put out there to keep sending people to your book. And I've been doing very little promotion. I've been, I've been tweeting with hashtags. Mm -hmm. I talk about it on my, well, I shouldn't say very little promotion because I have an audience of several thousand people, but I talk about it on my show it is hard to get people from a podcast onto the web. It's like it's like you're taking them from one medium, one source of information to another source of information. A lot of people don't like to do things for some reason when you tell them, hey, I got this book online. It's like, yeah, it's online. I'll do that later. I want to stay on my podcast. I want to keep this in my ears. I'm jogging. I'm yeah. ironing my clothes. So I think the rep the repeated times that I talk about my book on my podcast will eventually get people there. So Immediately after the the zero dollar days stopped, um, I or actually right before the zero dollar days stopped, I actually got two sales. So right before I started the zero dollar days or whatever mm -hmm. they're called, I got two sales out of nowhere. I was like, "Well, that's interesting." And then the zero dollar days stopped, and I got another two sales. And then the next day, I got another two sales. I was like, "Where are these sales coming from? How are they doing this?" And then someone actually lent the book, mm -hmm. or or something like that. I, I forget what the, the K-O-L-L -L stands for. What does that mean? Do you know? Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know how the abbreviation is opening up, but it's uh, it's about the Kindle Unlimited part. So Oh, I the, think that's the Kindle Online Lending Library, maybe. Yeah, most probably. That's, that's the ones who are um, Prime members. Yeah, maybe that's it. They yeah, get that's it right. for free from the Lending that's Library. Yeah. That's what it was. And I made a sale there as well. That's interesting. So then, the, the if they're in that prime, then then my book is still kind of free to them. Yeah. If that, uh, yeah, absolutely. If oh, that's cool. They are all the uh, Amazon Prime members get the books which are enrolled in the KTB Select for free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if, if the book is exclusively on Amazon and enrolled in the KDB Select program, then all the Prime members get it for free. And I think there is a, a hashtag for Twitter, uh, Amazon Prime, or I have to check it, but I think it's Amazon Prime. And if you put it like that, it means that your book is on KDB and the Amazon Prime members can get it for free. That's really good advice. I'm writing that down because I do a lot of uh, Twitter marketing. And I highly recommend anyone who has a book to do Twitter marketing with hashtags. If you don't know what that is, look it up because that is very powerful. Yeah. And I will also include some links in the show notes because I have some resources from different blogs where they have list of hashtags specifically for authors. Oh, that's great. So, and, and it helps a lot because there, there is a huge list for, for uh, the times you are promoting your free days, for the times you, you want to get some prime members to lend your book and, you know, many different other things. Yeah. So that's excellent advice, actually. I'm glad you said that. But the, um, my zero dollar days have ended just a few days ago. So as of this recording, um, I, I've been, I've been selling for like three or four days. So it's just fresh. So it's brand new and I'm watching the rankings go up and down. But it seems I'm getting like maybe two to three sales at least every day or every other day. So that doesn't surprise me. It's not like hurting my heart to see that. 
Well, it's, it's <laughs> still good because I yeah. mean, uh, I I have three books on Amazon and I haven't touched them. I mean, I don't do any marketing for those because I will be signing a, a publishing contract soon for those. So I kind of, you know, I, nice. I put it on hold. I'm not really doing anything with them. And they were selling like this for two, three books per day once I stopped marketing those. And wow. after a certain period, they completely dropped to zero <laughs> so wow uh yeah it's, it's disappeared it's, yeah it, they are not visible anymore because their rankings are so low that people don't see them anymore and since they are not new books of course they don't even show up in in any new things so un unless i i start shaking them up and doing different things they will mm. most probably stay like that invisible so two or three for the volume of the promotion you're doing it's it's quite okay <laughs> That's great. Well, I didn't know that. I, the, the book gets older. It, it's just going to keep dropping and dropping. But Well, if you don't do anything, I mean, because to keep the ongoing sales if, for the beginning, when you just launch you and or when you are using these tools with the free days or the countdown with 99 cent pricing and things like that, it kind of, you know, re revives the things up somehow for, for a very short period of time. And, you know, it's easier when it's just the beginning. But if you want to keep the ongoing going sales then you have to do different things to keep those sales so you have to do ongoing marketing you have to as you are planning to get out uh, more books all the time because with each uh, next book the chances for selling the previous ones as well are, are increasing too so and since I'm I'm writing fiction novels, uh, I, I can't really put out the volume which which you can with the nonfiction. Books. Right, right. <laughs> because <laughs> each novel is at least around fifty, sixty thousand words. So you, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit different. Well, that's one one thing I'm excited about is that I see these sales like two or three a day. I mean, that's proof of concept right there. It's like if someone is if you get the right person to see it they're going to buy it. So I know that there's a proof of concept there. And as I come out with more books, now I'll have two books selling two a day. And then I'll have three books selling two a day. So the, the multiplying, the exponential, the exponential sales that will occur because of it is very exciting. And it also becomes, which is even, is even more exciting, passive income. It's Absolutely. like once you, once you put it in, out there, it's there to make money, whereas before, there's nothing there to make money. So I'm just so, I'm kind of disappointed that I didn't start this earlier, but at the same time, <laughs> I think I had to go through my learning process. Well, yeah. Well, I interviewed recently Steve Scout, and he's making full time income only by <sighs> Kindle books. Love it. So, <laughs> Love it. It's, it's just, it's very feasible. It's possible. Uh, I don't say that everyone can do that, of course. But, uh, you know, if there are people doing that, it means that uh, it can be done. Yes. And I, I think I'd have one piece of advice for anyone that is writing a book is don't worry about starting it, worry about finishing it. <laughs> Absolutely. The most difficult part of writing a book is finishing it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So just finish it. Don't don't care about starting it. Just finish it. Yeah, absolutely. Based on your experience, what would you advise uh, people who are just writing their books and will be self-publishing soon? Well, I think I think the hard part at least for me a couple times is when you're writing and, and I write, you know, I write my for my shows as well is everyone w worries about like getting writer's block. I think you you even shared with me last week, and yeah, I got some writer's block here. Yeah. It's like it's like this writer's block comes in and I was like, I don't like writer's block. What what is that about? So, I decided that when I get writer's block, that I'm just going to delete what I wrote because obviously I'm I'm it's kind of like going down a rockier and rockier path until you can no longer pass, you know, this road anymore. The road is just getting too rocky. Because yeah. well, since <laughs> since you brought this up, uh, oh good, <laughs> I, I would like to to kind of you know clarify. Uh, I I didn't say I had a writer's block. I said <laughs> I was stuck. 
Oh, okay. Be- That's different. <laughs> because I don't believe in writer's blocks, actually. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, I think it's it's in our minds and they don't really exist. It's it, There is no such thing. But, uh, you know, what I had actually, and yeah, I, I, I promised that I will share this with my listeners about the challenge I took and I started NaNoWriMo. And it went quite well. And I wrote for three days and I was very excited. I loved the general concept of the book. But what I did was I did like, you know, I decided to do like you and to experiment and did everything just, you know, the opposite way from what usually people who know things better advise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I didn't start NaNoWriMo by having the story in my head from start to finish and having the outline. So what I had was I had just the general book concept, which looked very original and, and really great. And I started writing and then I had the reader's question which said now what you know what happens next and i realized that i didn't not i did not only not know what happens next i didn't know what happens in general after what i've written in the book until it's finished <laughs> i get it so <laughs> so i realized that you know it's it's very diff- i mean it was very difficult to accept the fact that you know it's it's your fault it's no one else's fault you know you, you shouldn't have started a book which you didn't even have in your mind completely you just had the idea and that was all but on the other hand, I realized that, you know, if that's the situation, if I keep on forcing myself and writing bullshit, I will still not have the book in place anyway. So it's better to concentrate on things that are, you know, in place now and which are moving and, mm. you know, do it a bit later, even if it's not NaNoWriMo, you know, it, I don't have to wait for it for, for the next year. But, you know, whenever I have it's ready because books have to be born they have they kind of get prepared and you know hmm. and i usually feel when the book is ready and i start writing them so it's it's very uh, unprofessional approach but at least you know I, I know that this one won't happen at least now at least with the nanorimo so hmm. sometimes you just have to accept facts and say no and uh, i psychologically prepared myself for that because the first reaction was oh i failed you know oh mm. i gave up oh this is terrible but on the other hand i realized that you know it's just um decision you have to make and by saying no to this i'm saying yes to the other things which i wasn't going to do just because i was busy with the nanorimo so it's not always mm. just mm-hmm. you know it's not a complete failure thing it's just the de- cautious decision that i made actually you said two things that if you don't mind i'd like to comment on sure um one of them was structuring your book, outlining your book. One of the things I, I could never do, and I still can't do it, is create an outline for my book because it's not the way I think and it's not the way I write. And so when I start writing a, uh, an episode or a book, I just write it from start to finish, just the way my brain works. So mm-hmm. I, talk about unprofessional. I, I definitely, I don't put the outline at all. I don't lay out the chapters. I just write it from my head. Well, and then, uh, that's what I do as well. But usually you? I have it in my mind. I mean, I imagine, yeah. I, you know what you will be writing, right? From the beginning yeah. until the end. You imagine the thing in general, like the content you are going to share. And later on, while you start writing, it goes and it leads you. But you know yes. you know the content. So here in my problem, my problem was not really a detailed outline, which I never do usually. But my problem was I didn't know the content. I had the concept mm but I didn't know the content. So if you don't know what you're going to write and, you know, no matter what kind of outline you have, you you might even have the outline, for example, with the points, etc. But if you don't know how to open up the point and how to explain the things which are included there, you still won't be able to write the book, (laughs) even with the outline. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Oh, I just... I think I think you should give yourself permission because I, I was watching people and said, no, you got to write a book. In order to write a book, you have to create this outline. And so I would watch these and I would try. I would really try to create this outline. And then I would try to write the book and it just it just didn't work. It, it was, I was I was resisting it completely. So I threw it out and just wrote my own way and it just flowed out naturally. It just felt so much better for me. So I finally gave myself permission to not have to do. That's one of my rebellious behaviors. Not have to do what the pros tell you to do. If Absolutely. It, 
Mm-hmm. If it comes out the way it's supposed to come out, that's the way it is. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree. So, I agree that there is absolutely no... Assert- I mean, there are people who say that uh, you should write every single day, which is very good. I tell that too. But it does... I mean, um, you know, <laughs> if you miss a day or two or if you miss even a week, it doesn't really matter that much. Because mm-hmm. if you're going to write later on, I mean, what we are talking about is having the writing in your lifestyle. So it's not, yeah. you know, having it, writing every day is a bit exaggerated thing. But what they, we mean in, uh, in this is just, you know, have it as part of your lifestyle and write often and write when you feel like writing. And it should be like, you know, you shouldn't, ha- because if you don't write for a month or two, you won't be doing it anymore so that that's the the only reason but there are people who say you should write in the mornings you should write in the evenings you should write with music you should write in silence everyone (laughs) has to experiment and find his own way totally agree because it's now even I'll, i'll tell you what i mean even i wrote three books and all three of them i wrote them differently in different environments because i think that what you are writing also kind of dictates the best way to write it as well mm-hmm, mm-hmm. a good metaphor for that actually uh, as far as writing all the time is i play classical guitar and sometimes i'll be a st- i'll be stuck on a piece and i'll play it over and over again and i keep making the same mistakes over and over again and i will end up taking a few days off of playing all together and I'll go back to that same piece and suddenly I play it well. And you approach it differently because I approach it differently. I stop repeating bad habits. I'm out of that stuck mindset and the break just refreshed my mind. It regenerated, re-energized me. So I truly believe that if if you're writing so much that you're always getting stuck, you're probably writing too much <laughs> or writing too many times, yeah, I should say. Yeah, most probably. Or, or you're not really, uh, you know, ready to put that exact piece on paper yet. Maybe, yeah. I don't know. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, it, it was really nice talking to you. Uh, I really appreciate the time you spent with us. Um, you know, any last words to our listeners? Before? Well, I love, this, I love this conversation. Thanks for having me. And um, I actually... I didn't feel I was qualified to be on this show because <laughs> I was like, I still don't feel like I'm an author and that, uh, but we should I realized, work on that because, yeah, maybe yeah. <laughs> but at the same time I have a book out there and it's in over a thousand hands now. That means a thousand more people that maybe didn't know about me before now know about me. And now, you know, most probably they know you as an author, not a podcaster. So. Yes. Think about that. <laughs> it's so true. I do have one last piece of, piece of advice is that, I don't know if it's an advice or maybe a suggestion, is that I built my online presence way before I made a book. Meaning I, I had a website and I had a podcast and that's not necessary, but you know at least a blog or something so that when people get your book for the first time, they have a place to go and say, who is this person? Because that's what the first thing they're going to do is look you up. Yeah. <laughs> Who is this person? So I feel confident knowing that after a year of networking with people and building my online presence and just being out there as much as I can, that when people get my book finally and they look me up, they'll say, oh, this guy does a lot of stuff or I like what it has. It shows my entire profile, my message, everything. So I just like that they can connect with me beyond the book. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the conversation. Uh, And um, I wish you success with your podcast and with all your upcoming books. Oh, yeah. And I guess I should say if anyone wants to find me, it's theoverwhelmedbrain.com. And I'll be happy to connect with you there or listen to the uh, podcast on iTunes. It's The Overwhelmed Brain, same name. And it was great to be here. Thank you, Annie. Well, as you can see, you can use your content in various different forms. So you can have um, a book which was created based on different blog posts. You can end up, like Paul did, having podcast episodes as Kindle ebooks and uh, different other things. So every time you create a content, think about how else you can use and that will enlarge your audience and you will reach out more people who would otherwise not know about you. Well, as a last reminder, get your Twitter hashtags for writers over 100 
Twitter hashtags that I have collected, which successful writers use at www.annialexander.com slash 46. You will get the link to the PDF there and I hope it will help you with your Twitter strategy. Take care, continue writing, believe in yourself and never give up. <laughs>